It's a beautiful hymn. Whenever you are discouraged, just, just turn to hymn 181. You'll find out that Jesus does care. He does care. Hear our every need, our every plea. Good morning, church, and happy Sabbath. Are you happy you're here? Amen. Amen. I'm happy to be back here in my home church. I was at my other home church. I have several home churches. But I'm happy to be here in the house of God with you again. And you may have noticed or not, in the foyer there is a little table of the, with the glow tracks. And it is the first Sabbath of the month. And so if you, will like, if you like sharing these with friends, with neighbors, um, co-workers, or just perfect strangers, there is a packet there to take where you can uh, just share one of these with someone and spread the love of God and be a testimony to others as well. This year, as I had hinted several weeks ago, I am going to dedicate the entire year for last day events. The entire year on last day events and preparation for last day events. Do we want to be prepared for when Jesus comes? Do we want to be aware of things that are going to come? Well, the Bible tells us, the Bible and the spirit of prophecy paint it all clear that everything that we need to know is available for us to know. But before we do, friends, there is one basic thing that we have to get, the foundation of Christianity. And this message not, not only applies to this church, but this message can apply to every single church, whether Seventh-day Adventist or other denomination. Because this is a problem that every single church has. So with that in mind, I just invite you to bow your heads as we have one more prayer. Father in heaven, speak to us as we open your word through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 17, our scripture reading. Please open your Bibles there. John 17. Verses 20 and 21. I thank very much the Jelly, the Jale family for reading the scripture, reading the scripture verse. And there Jesus is praying. Chapter 17 is Jesus prays for himself and he prays for his disciples. And he prays for his future disciples, which, is, which are you and I. And here he prays and says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's, that's us. We believe Jesus through the testimony of the disciples. That they all may be one. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. The world may believe that you have sent me. Notice verses 22 and 23. And the glory which you gave me I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Is there a word that pops out that is repeating, is being repeated in these verses? One. Did you catch it there? In be beginning in verse 21, that they may be one that they also may be one in us. 
Verse 22, And the glory which you gave me, I have given them to you, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one. In oneness. This is Jesus' last prayer for his church. He is about to go to the cross. He is about to die. He is done with his ministry. He, is, he spent three and a half years with his disciples, teaching them, exhorting them on how to do church and how to be good, good disciples and ministers. And here in his last prayer, in his last prayer for his disciples, right before he goes to Gethsemane and goes to Calvary, he's got one burden, just one burden. What's that burden? That they may be one. That they may be one. When Jesus prays for his church, he only has one burden on his mind, that they may be one. There's nothing here about praying that they may be better Sabbath keepers. Is the Sabbath important? Should we keep the seventh day holy? Yes, absolutely, it is important. God is going to come for his church that keep all of his commandments, the Bible tells us. That includes the Sabbath. The Sabbath is important. It is the seal of the living God in the last days. It's what's going to separate at the end, as, we, as, we, as we're going to study in the further months, what exactly how the Sabbath is going to affect your life. But here we don't see anything in Jesus' in Jesus prayers about his disciples remembering to keep the Sabbath, no? We don't see anything about them being more faithful in tithe and offering, either. Is returning tithe and giving an offering important? Absolutely. Absolutely. God, God tells us to return the tithes and offering to Him, not to rob Him. We don't just rob God from tithes, but from offerings as well from offerings as well. But yet, here Jesus isn't worried about tithe or offerings. He isn't worried about here that they even eat healthy and that they exercise and drink their apple juice and carrot juice. Should we live and eat healthy? Absolutely. Friends, sadly to say, the church, the church mostly has abandoned the health message. But here, God, Jesus' last prayer has nothing to do with, with eating. I don't see anything about Jesus being worried about the dress code. His main purpose, his main point is that they may be one. That they may be one. When Christ prays for his church, his only burden his only burden is that his people get along. That his people get along. Forget the Sabbath, forget the law, forget the diet, forget the tithes. If they can only become one. If they learn to get along, the rest will take care of itself. Now, I'm a little bit confused and disturbed because I would expect God to be worried in his last prayer, his last prayer for his disciples about the Sabbath, about sanctification. So we're going to see why Jesus prayed this prayer. What was the context? What led him for his prayer to be, Lord, just have my disciples and my future disciples in Cleburne and Texas just get along. If you turn to the book of Luke, chapter 22, we're going to see why Jesus, le what led him to, to this prayer. Luke, chapter 22. Luke, chapter 22. They had been with Jesus for three and a half years. He had been trying to teach them how to do, how to do church, how to love thy neighbors, how to heal others, how to share the good news. And yet, the disciples had not gotten it yet. I'm amazed at how God is patient with us. 
Because friends, you and I can be stiff-necked and stubborn people. Yeah. Amen. I'll say amen for you. You and I are sometimes stubborn people. Jesus is teaching, rebuking his church during his ministry, but there is a basic, a basic thing that the church needs. Christianity 101, and the disciples haven't gotten it, and that is just get along with each other. Just love each other. Just get along with each other. There in Luke chapter 22, verse 15. Verse 15. It says, Then he said to them, With fervent desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. With fervent desire. He's about to leave. He's about to to end the, his ministry, he's about to be crucified with, servant, with fervent desire, he says. I have desired to eat this Passover. He just wants some peace. But notice verse 21. There in Luke 22, 21. But behold, the hand, Jesus says, of my betrayer is with me on the table. Someone showed up to communion service with their own agenda. With their own agenda. He had taken bread with his betrayer. Right there. He's taking bread and juice with his betrayer. And if that isn't enough, if we look in verse 24. Verse 24, there in Luke 22, 24. Now there was... Also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. They came to the table with the nominating committee stacked with positions. And if you even were to read Matthew 26, 26, when one of the mothers of the disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, when you come in your kingdom, can you have my, my, one of my sons sit on your right hand and your other on your left hand? There the mother is basically saying, Lord, when you become president, have one be the secretary and the other one the treasurer, please. Here they're disputing who is the greatest. That is a church Jesus is praying for. That is a church that in his last moments of prayer, in his last moments, he is praying that his people just get along. Not worry about positions. Not worry about who's going to be the greatest. He is trying to have his Disciples just get along. And we read, we, we read later on where Jesus even told Peter that he would deny him also. This is why church, the, the church is a hospital. The church should be a hospital. Have you ever been to a hospital and have you ever noticed that the heart patients aren't complaining or talking about the cancer patients? Or the diabetic patients aren't looking down the hall. Is there a buzz going on? the heart patients or diabetic patients or cancer patients don't have time to criticize each other. They're busy dealing with what? Their own sickness. Their own sickness. The cancer patient is only worried about his cancer. The diabetic only with his problem. The heart patient only with his problem. They don't have time to be criticizing and talking about the other patients. We, and the church is the exact same way. The exact same way. The only well person in this church is a Dr. Jesus. Amen? Amen? Amen. 
You don't have time to be looking at others' sickness, diseases, sins, and be talking about it. <clears throat> I hope they'll be trying to fix that buzzing there. But don't mind it. You see, church, we can have certificates, we can hold positions, we can be elders, we can be deacons, we can be so many things. We can be pastors, a head pastor, associate pastors, but if we do not love one another, it means nothing. How many positions I have, how many degrees I have, how many doctorates I can maybe get, it means nothing if I do not love and like my fellow brothers and sisters. Just getting along. Just getting along. If we don't get along with each other, God's going to have a hard time taking us to heaven. Because in heaven, everyone's going to get along with each other. Everyone will love each other. Embrace each other. This is why, if you turn to Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, this is why, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, here on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. By the way, if you were to look for that phrase, to hate your enemy, you will never ever find it in the Old Testament. That was a tradition that was passed. You got to love your neighbors, but you, gotta, but you can hate your enemy. God never said that. But here Jesus is saying, you've heard that. You may have heard of those rumors. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Thank you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. If you're the only, if your only friend at church is someone that you get along with, you still haven't got the basic of Christianity. The basic of Christianity that Jesus is praying for. His church is to be one, to love one another, to get along with one another. Here Jesus is saying the person who talks behind your back, love them and bless them. Bless them, pray for them. The person who goes to the pastor to recommend for you to be taken out of the nominating committee or be taken out of whatever it is, bless them. Bless them, pray for them. Don't pray, friends, that something bad may come to them. No, 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 no. When I say pray for them, pray for them that, that God may bless them abundantly. The member who talks about your son or your daughter who may not be a good example or maybe they may not be in church but others talk about them, Jesus is here telling us, pray for them and bless them. Pray for them and bless them. You, Jesus says, you have not gotten the basic of Christianity if all you do is get along with people who like you. You, you know, he even says here, even the heathens do that. Because it takes grace from God to love us. It takes grace from God for us to love others. And it takes something extra. It's not in us to love others. It's not in us to love those who maybe rub us the wrong way. It's not in us to put a smile for someone. You know, you may, you may know someone that when the phone rings and you answer it and you hear their, their voice on the other line, you kind of wish you didn't answer. And you're like, oh man, that brother, what does he want again? God, friends, let me tell you, 
That's why the church, the church is filled with different kinds of people. With different kinds of people. Because God has placed different kinds of people for you and me to learn to love different kinds of people. That person that just gets under your skin, that person that you, saw, you see maybe coming down the hall and you go around, God brought them, believe it or not, for you. God brought them here for you. The person that you may, that you may think, you know, that person shouldn't be a teacher. That person, they need to discipline that person. I don't know, I can't believe. God brought that person for you so you can learn to love that person. If you can learn to love that person, you just might be ready for the kingdom of heaven. And notice verse, verse 45 in Matthew 5, 45. When he tells us, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who, who hate you, and pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Until we do this, we ain't God's children. God is waiting. And there's a reason why, as I mentioned, there's all kinds of people in church. Some that we just love and are just connect. Others we don't. And, to, and the ones that we don't, God is telling us, you need my grace in you to be gracious to them and to love them. And to love them. The most dangerous thing in church are people with sin. Now you may think, well, we all have sin. No, no, no. Yes, we all have sin. The most dangerous thing in church are people with sin. What I'm talking about is, it's easy for us, for me, to take my eyes off my sin and look at your sin and start talking about your sin and start talking about others about your sin. And we try to, to be holy, right? When we say, I'm not perfect, but, but here it comes, right? I'm not perfect, but I would never come dressed like that. But I would never behave that way. I would never eat that. Friends, let's not kid ourselves. And pretend that, that we are better than others. The only perfect person here is Jesus Christ. Amen. And the greatest proof of grace in a church is gracious people. The only proof that a church is full of grace is when the people are full of grace. When the people are gracious. The greatest evidence that you are growing in grace is that you are gracious towards one another toward one another whenever somebody joins a church who may be a single mom who may have three or four children from three or four different fathers God brought them to the church so you can learn to keep quiet so you can learn to zip it and say welcome to the house of God Amen. welcome to the house of God the greatest evidence that you are growing in grace is that we show grace toward others just how God has shown grace to you. Just how God has shown grace to us. What God is looking for is evidence. Jesus is praying his prayer, his last prayer, that his church may be one. And friends, unfortunately, the church hasn't changed. The church is still dividing. The church is still doesn't get along. And Christ's last prayer is the same, the same request today. Go back to John 17. This is, this is why it's so important that we become one. Verse 23, John 17, verse 23. You may be thinking, well, what's the big deal if I don't get along? It's a big deal to God because it was his last prayer request for you and me. Verse 23 says, 
I in them and you in me that they may be made perfect in you and that the world, there it is, there is the reason why, that the world may know that you have sent me. The only way that we can have a better testimony to the world is that if we get along, if we love each other. You see, when the world sees a church that's fighting, a church that can't get along, a church that divides, the world's going to say, really? That's what your God does? I don't want any part of that. I already have my own problems at work. I already have my own divisions with my family. Why should I come to a divided church? But when the church, but when the world sees a church that despite of their differences in cultures, in character, in problems, that the church still loves one another, still cares for one another, and doesn't criticize each other, then the world will say, there's something about that church. Then the world may say, I don't know if there's a God, but if there is, it's in that church. It's in that church. That, they, that the world may know that you have sent me and that have loved them as you have loved me. That is why in John 13, 34, if you turn to chapter 13, Verse 34. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And notice verse 35. By this, by what? What's the this? Love one another, right? By this. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you love, if you have love for one another. By this the world's going to know that we are disciples of Jesus, that if we love and get along and like one another. It's not because I wear a Jesus t-shirt that the world knows that I'm a disciple. It's not because I got a bumper sticker of that I'm a Christian. It's not because I listen to my Christian jams. No. It's not because I come in a suit to church. It's because they see that we love one another. And we get along with one another. Yes, we may have differences of idea and opinions. That's what, makes us the, that's what makes us need Christ. That only with the grace of Christ we can love one another. And put aside our differences of ideas, of things. By the grace of God. Gra grace is God's love toward this world and the church reflecting that love toward one another, friends. Jesus prayed his last prayer. And as I begin, as we begin this new year, before we talk about final events and preparation for the last days and the Sunday laws and what's happening in the, in the White House, before all of those things, friends, we got to get the basic thing. Love and get along with each other. We have to. You want to go to heaven? Yeah. You got to get along with each other, friends. You have to. It's not a question. And some of us may need to go into our, into our closet and pray, Lord, I have a problem with brother, sister, so-and-so. Please give me the grace that I need. The love that I need. My appeal to you today and this year is that we learn to love each other and like each other. You see, I've heard it said, oh, I love so-and-so, but I just don't like them. <laughs> That's not going to work for God. Thank God that God not, not only loves you, but He likes you too. 
In spite of our differences, he still likes you. Otherwise, he wouldn't have invested his time and coming to rescue you and dying for you. Now, I do believe that this church does a good job in loving one another. I do. But we can do better. We can always do better. Some of, some of us have been spirit, are more spiritual, mature than others. And we need to be a little more gracious to the babes in Christ that are, are learning to barely walk the Adventist walk. The Adventist Christian walk. I want to draw your attention to the meditation in your bulletin from the Acts of the Apostles. This is how important it is for us to love one another. It's in the back of your bulletin. Acts of the Apostles, page 87. The heart of those who had been converted under the labors of the apostles were softened and united by Christian love. Despite formal prejudices, what kind of prejudices? Formal. That means that what? They put them away. Now they're under Christ's love. Now, now they are converted. Despite their formal prejudices, all were in harmony with one another. Amen. Now notice the next sentence. Satan knew that so long as, that, that so long as this union continued to exist, he would be powerless to check the progress of gospel truth. Are you catching that, friends? The church getting along and being one and, and loving each other is defeating the devil. Amen. He knew that so long as this union continued to exist, he would be powerless to check the progress of the gospel truth. And he sought to take advantage of formal habits. What does former mean? They were there before, but they're not there now. Remember, remember earlier, it says, despite former prejudices, well, Satan wants to bring them back up. To take advantage of formal habits of thoughts in the hope that thereby he might be able to introduce into the church elements of what? Disunion. Disunion. Friends, do we want to kick the devil where it hurts? Love and get along with those you don't love and get along with. You want to see the devil have a hard time in this church? I do. We need to love and get along with those we don't love and don't get along. Is this easy? Nope. It absolutely isn't. That's why we need the grace of God to dwell in us for us to be gracious with others. To be gracious with others. Friends, it's easy to get along with those we like. Isn't it? Yes, it's easy to go home and visit with friends that we just click. But try inviting somebody that just gets under your skin home to eat. Do it. And pray to God, Lord, help me to begin to love this person and like this person because you died for them just like you died for me. You care for them just how you care for me. Help me to sh be gracious just how you are gracious to me. And Jesus' last prayer here is, forget the Sabbath, forget the law, forget all that. His main burden, his main burden at the church, just get along. The church, just get along. There is never, 
Never, never, never. I'll say it and I can be recorded. There is never a reason why a church should divide. Never. Whatever problem the church may have, the church needs to work it out. The church needs to stick it out and work it out. Leaving the congregation isn't a solution. There is never a reason why the church should divide. The church, I invite you right now to all stand. We're all standing. Now I would like for you, hold on, we're not done yet. We're not, I mean, we can come to the piano and that's fine. I'd like for us to hug the person next to you, behind you, and in front of you. Hug them. Church, church, we need to, just how we hugged, not only do this when we come once a week here, and I am guilty of this, but we need to also search for each other throughout the week and visit one another and hug and pray and be there for one another. We are not a family that just meets once a week. So I just encourage you to love one another, like one another, put up with one another. And if you don't like something about them, so what? They might not like something about you either. <laughs> Friends, only in the kingdom of heaven are going to be people for love for one another. And that was Jesus' last prayer request. That they may be one. May be one. And Jesus knew that the devil would have a hard time as long as this oneness existed. Father in heaven, Lord my God, forgive us whenever we have not been one. Whenever we have shown dislike to others. Maybe not through our words, but through our actions, which, which speak louder than our words. Forgive me, Lord, whenever I have shunned someone. And I ask that you put in every single one of our hearts your grace so that we can be gracious and loving to others. Lord, we are not ready for your coming. We need to learn to love one another more. And I thank you, Lord, for your grace and your patience with your church. If you were patient with your disciples who were fighting for positions, betraying you, Lord, you can be patient with us. Thank you very much. Bless your church here in Cleburne. Bless your church here in Texas. Bless your church around the world. That your church may be one everywhere. And as we are preparing for this general conference this year, that we may continue to be a united church. Thank you, Father, for your great love. Bless your people, for they are yours. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.